Hey there, and welcome to this week's edition of Clean Technica's news broadcast. My name is Hanan, I'm your host, and this week we are again publishing on a Saturday. Uh, last week that worked out really well for us, so we decided to try that again, and if it works out equally well this week, well, we might consider moving the new show to Saturday permanently. What do you guys think works better, Friday or Saturday? Please let us know in the comments down below. And now, let's get to the news. Oil spill in Siberia. So Siberia is a pretty popular place lately. I already covered last week that temperatures there rose to record highs. And this week, a different type of disaster took place there, an oil spill. Now, I've also covered in the past how in the area, the melting permafrost, uh, the release of CO2 and methane is an enormous problem and warrants some serious attention. I've also covered in the past that Russia joined the Paris Climate Accords in October 2019 which was shocking at the time because Russia's previous position on the issue was that either there is no issue or it's not an issue. So what could have possibly made the side of oil change its mind? Well, the answer is losing oil, and all of this is related to each other. See, a lot of Russia's oil and gas fields are located underneath permafrost, and a big chunk of Russia's oil and gas pipelines also go across permafrost. If climate change continues, so does the melting of permafrost, which can lead to a total collapse of Russia's fossil fuel network. As a matter of fact, since the early 1990s, production capacity at various facilities has gone down somewhere between 2 to 20 percent because these facilities, they were built on top of permafrost, which used to be as solid, strong and permanent as concrete. But now it has become soft and these facilities can no longer hold the same weight that they could in the past without collapsing. These are actually words that I wrote in an article all the way back in October 2019. And now that what was predicted has now come to pass. In the city of Norilsk, Russia, a part of Siberia, a part of the Arctic Circle, a fuel tank holding 21,000 tons of diesel oil has collapsed, meaning 6,000 tons of diesel oil have spilled onto the ground and 15,000 uh, tons have spilled into various bodies of water, including at least one river. This is the first oil spill of its kind, one caused by melting permafrost, that is. Now, uh, the company that owns the fuel tank, uh, called Narilsk T uh, Temir Energy Co., which is actually owned by a company uh, called Nor Nickel, which is how you know the people usually refer to it as, has put out a statement that said, The accident was caused by a sudden sinking of supporting posts in the basement of the storage tank. The diesel oil intended for heating homes is dyed red, and because of that, huge swaths of the Ambarnaya River have also turned red. Here's a video from Twitter of what that looks like. What makes matters worse is that the Russian government only found out because people started posting it on social media. Since then, Vladimir Putin has announced a state of emergency, and a criminal case of negligence has now been launched against the company. So far, the company has only managed to clean up 1,500 cubic meters on land and pump out 201 tons of diesel oil out of the water. The company is owned by the, one of the wealthiest people in Russia, Vladimir Patanin. He has a fortune of 25 billion. Although it would be more accurate to say that he had a fortune of $25 billion because the cleanup has already costed him $1.5 billion. Now, one way or another, Russia is going to lose a lot of money, either by having to invest a lot into infrastructure to compensate for the melting permafrost, or by significantly lowering oil productions to make sure nothing else collapses. I just really hope they'll be able to prevent other oil spills of this kind, because they're just detrimental to the wildlife and the nature around them, and they are really difficult to clean up. A Model 3 crashed into a truck. So this week in the news was a Model 3 that crashed into an overturned truck on a highway in Taiwan. And the reason that I included this story is because I want to add a bit of context to what happened. You see, the situation is very reminiscent to another accident that happened in 2018 when a Model S crashed into a stationary fire truck. Now obviously Teslas have sensors and cameras on all sides. What they do is they monitor what's going around them, prevent uh, the car from hitting anything while trying to follow uh, the rules on the road. If a vehicle suddenly breaks, that is easy to detect because it was nearby and in motion. However, Tesla basically only has two long distance sensors. First is a radar that can see up to 160 meters ahead of it. Uh, it's located somewhere here. 
and a camera that sees up to 250 meters in front of it. It's located right here in the middle. So let's start with the radar, and here's the catch. This sensor was apparently not designed to detect stationary objects. And here's something that Tesla wrote in its blog in 2016 about its radar. When the car is approaching an overhead highway road sign positioned on a rise in a road or a bridge where the road dips underneath, this often looks like a collision course. The navigation data and height accuracy of the GPS are not enough to know whether the car will pass under the object or not. By the time the car is close and the road pitch changes, it's too late to brake. Also something that not everyone might realize is that the radar it sees through objects. So if the two cars ahead of you are about to collide, the Tesla will know it ahead of time while the driver will not. And here's just a thought, but a truck, besides the actual vehicle with the engine and the driver, the back of a truck is just a thin walled box. If it's empty, the radar might not properly register it. So we move on to the camera. Now, as I already mentioned, there is only one long distance camera right in the middle. And as you might recall from biology, we see distance because we have two eyes. Lose one eye and we lose depth perception. And the same is true for a car. Now with just one camera in the middle, you could via software still try to calculate distance, but it's a lot harder. Now, unless Tesla puts the two cameras on the two sides of the car, having two right in the middle won't help much. Another thing to consider is that this huge white surface of a truck could easily be interpreted as something like glare. Uh, it's very low contrast, it's also a corner case, and you know it remains unclear what the camera thought it saw. But, you know, I hope this was at least somewhat useful in explaining what happened there. Supercharger plans. So, continuing with Tesla news, it seems the company is planning on significantly ramping up deployment of superchargers across China. Currently, the country has 2,500 superchargers already. However, by the end of the year, that should be a total of 6,500 superchargers. An interesting thing to note from the exact same press conference is that Tesla said they will be building superchargers throughout Asia to make it possible to drive all the way from China to London. Something I'm quite sure will please China's Belt and Road Initiative. However, I doubt this will be happening anytime soon, because already for years Tesla has been promising to expand the European uh, supercharger network all the way to Moscow, but, you know, until now, very little progress has been made. In general, deploying superchargers to new countries has been very, very slow. Tesla has increased supercharger density in existing markets, but not yet expanded to new ones, and, you know, this has already been puzzling for quite some time. New Tunnel Project now, boring through the earth and reaching the other side, we have some boring company news in the US. A tunnel project connecting Rancho Cucamonga and Ontario International Airport has apparently been approved. The tunnel will be 2.8 miles in length, 35 feet under the surface, and use vehicles on rubber wheels that will go up to speeds of 127 miles per hour. These vehicles that Tesla will be working on, whatever that means, uh, will come in a form of a van that seats up to 12 people. The ride is supposed to take between 90 and 120 seconds. The cost of the project is estimated to be somewhere around $60 million, uh, whereas the alternatives would have cost between $1 to $1.5 billion and would have come in the form of a railway of some sort. Now, unlike the competition, it's only going to take 3 to 4 years rather than 10 years to complete this project. In general, it sounds like a really great deal. New EV Incentives So this week, two neighboring countries announced some new EV incentives. Germany and my country, the Netherlands. Now, in the Netherlands, the new EV incentive is 4,000 euros for new cars and 2,000 euros for used cars. Now, I must say, this is a huge step forward because currently the Tanner Range Plus costs 48,980 euros, where in Germany it costs 43,990 euros. While this incentive does not get us German prices, it does get us closer. At least, that was the case until Germany also announced their new incentives. So, they already had an incentive of 3,000 euros, and that is being doubled to 6,000 euros. And then there's also a 3,000 euro manufacturer stipend, so the consumer in total would save 9,000 euros. So, the total price of a Model 3 standard range isn't 43,990, but 37,990. And this would be the very first time that any country beats Iceland's price for a Model 3, uh, there it used to, there the Model 3 cost 38,116 euros, but now Germany is cheaper, and actually Germany is now the cheapest place in Europe to buy a Tesla Model 3. Charging at a gas station? 
So I am mentioning this right after the previous story because the German incentives for electric vehicles are actually part of a 130 billion euro stimulus plan. And what was also part of the exact same plan is a requirement for all gas stations around the country to also offer EV charging. Now, last year, uh, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, she uh, put forth a goal to have a million EV chargers by 2030. Well, with this new stimulus plan, it seems that they're going to be reaching that a lot sooner. Neo battery swaps. The Tesla Model S was originally designed to be able to swap batteries. This, however, was pretty quickly discontinued because it was not uh, practical and because people weren't interested, or so Tesla claimed. So the other manufacturers that were first uh, making fun of EVs and are now cowering in Tesla's shadow are not going to try something this bold that even Tesla considered unfeasible. Well, it seems that one automaker did not get that memo and that is Chinese startup NEO. I must say, I never expected it, but NEO stuck with it and succeeded at something Tesla decided to abandon. In this week's news, NEO announced that it has now successfully swapped 500,000 batteries. Located along China's busiest highways, the company now has 136 battery swap stations where a swap just takes a few minutes. This is the second week in a row that I find myself praising NEO. Sunshine in the UK. It seems 2020, in terms of climate change, is again breaking some pretty significant records. Met Office, the official meteorological service of the UK, has reported that this has been the sunniest spring on record by a significant margin. Take a look at this graph that they published. That is literally 100 hours more than the previous record in 1948. Guess what? This many hours of sunlight in spring would also qualify it into the top five sunniest summers. There were only three other summers on record that had more sunlight than this spring in the UK. Heat and CO2. So now expanding the scope of climate change from the UK to the entire world, May 2020 was the hottest May on record ever. 2019 in general was the hottest year on record ever and 2020 is perfectly on schedule to get into the top five. It is almost certainly going to reach the top five. There's a 98% certainty of that. Then when it comes to CO2 levels, May also broke a record at 417 parts per million. This is two parts per million more than the previous May and is consistent with the predicted rate of change. There were people that thought uh, that this won't rise further because of the shutdowns with the pandemic, but those people were overly enthusiastic. It's important to keep in mind that there is a difference between atmospheric CO2 and the pollution that we generate and breathe in at the troposphere level. Even if pollution were to stop 100% today, the atmospheric CO2 level wouldn't just magically go down unless we actively take it out, because all that we put in there is all cumulative. All electric BMW M5. BMW has a funny relationship with electric cars, let me tell you that. Two years after Nissan started production of the Leaf, BMW started production of the i3. This was the early EV world, and when BMW announced their i3, they also at the same time announced the i8, a new sort of hybrid that has an abysmally small battery that might not even last you a round trip to the grocery store. And it also has a not very powerful three-cylinder engine. You get a good Tesla-like acceleration, pretty good fuel efficiency, at least on paper, and no long charging sessions. The vehicle, however, was not very popular, it was uh, very expensive, and throughout its lifetime, since 2013-2014, only 15,000 have been sold. And believe it or not, BMW was working on a follow-up to the i8. However, in today's news, BMW said that they are shelving those plans for what they were calling the BMW M Next, and are instead focusing on an all-electric BMW M5. And the specs for this vehicle are pretty impressive. BMW says that the vehicle will have a 135 kilowatt hour battery, 250 kilowatt electric motors, acceleration of 2.9 seconds, and 435 miles of range. Now, in the beginning of 2019, we actually visited BMW headquarters in the US, and what they told us is that they are working on a common platform uh, so that a diesel uh, slash benzene version, a electric version, and a hydrogen version can be built around on the same platform and even potentially on the same manufacturing line. Now, we at the time thought this might not be the best idea and that it would lead to less capable electric vehicles because a battery electric skate really is the only way to go. Now, the 135 kilowatt hour number to me means that they are still waiting on solid state batteries. 
Now, while it's speculation, to me, this also seems like they are still going forward with this one platform fits all idea that they had and uh, that they haven't learned their lesson, not in the fact that they need a battery skate uh, to really make it work, nor the fact that waiting for solid state batteries just puts them further behind. Volvo sales. Super short story, but it turns out that 14% of Volvo's sales were actually plug-in electric hybrids. Who would have thought? Last year, in 2018, they were at half of that at only 7%. GM electric van. There's been a lot of buzz lately about electric pickup trucks, but really there hasn't been all that much talk about all electric vans. I mean, of course, Nissan has already had their E and V200 since like 2012. Opel slash Vauxhall uh, now have the Vivaro E that is starting to roll out. But really, this segment is just starting. And GM has very high hopes for claiming this market for itself. According to several insiders that have leaked to Reuters, the company is working on a van codenamed BV1. Production is supposed to start in 2021, and it will actually be built in the exact same reconfigured Detroit Hamtrak plant that will also produce the electric Hummer pickup. The vehicle will use the new Ultium pouch cells that GM recently announced during their EV day. And while the company didn't officially confirm this themselves, uh, suppliers for both GM and Ford have said that they don't want uh, to leave this market open for Tesla like they did with commercial vehicles. It may not be glamorous, but it's profitable. Electric vehicle only geofencing. Fiat Chrysler Automotives are pretty far behind when it comes to electric vehicles. I mean, they do have some plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and they are running a pretty interesting experiment. More and more cities are introducing these sort of green zones in the city where only electric vehicles can go. And so what the company is experimenting with is a sort of a geofencing feature where when a car or a PHEV uh, or a regular hybrid drives into one of these zones, it will switch to EV mode, turn off the internal combustion engine and lock it out until the vehicle exits one of these zones. Now, for now, it's just an experiment, but it's a pretty interesting thought, uh, concept to think about. You enter a specific zone and your car doesn't allow you to use the internal combustion engine anymore until you leave it. Well, it's pretty interesting. And that was it for this week's broadcast. We hope that you guys liked it. And if you did, please give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends that also like clean tech. We greatly appreciate that. Now, everything that we cover in this news broadcast, we also write articles about and links to those can be found in the video description down below. And sometimes, in some cases, a pop-up will appear in this corner. Other than that, I wish you guys a wonderful weekend, and till next time, see ya.